We got to talk about 9-11 now, Duncan. He's so heavy. He's so incredibly heavy. Everybody, you know, this girl I'm friends with on Facebook, she put a, a photo of Donald Trump up holding a flag, and she goes, two days after 9-11, she goes, he'll always get my vote. He's always put America first. And you're like, well, if that's all we need to do to secure your vote is to hold up a flag on the roof of a building two days after a national tragedy, well, then that's, ah, he'll never not get my vote. Right. Even if he serves two terms and he wants to serve another one, He'll get my vote because he held a flag up after 9-11. By the way, one of the funniest things ever that I've ever seen, there was this tour guide who was like this old, bitter guy. And he was just an angry guy when I was a tour guide in New York City on those double-decker buses. Mm -hmm. And it was the anniversary of 9-11 and he got on the bus and like a British couple had asked about the heroism of the firefighters. Like, they went, it must have been an amazing day. Maybe they were Australian. I'll never get these right. Some are British, and then some come out Australian. But let's say they were from the land down under. And he was like, well, it was real heroes that day. And the guy's response was the best I've ever heard. He goes, he goes that's all a lie. He goes, I was downtown. I saw those buildings fall and the cops and the firemen, he goes, they ran the other way. <laughs> he goes, no one ran into those buildings. He goes, I watched it. He goes, so you can believe whatever lie you want. He goes, nobody was running into those burning buildings. They were running away. They were cowards. I swear, the whole bus was just frozen. They didn't know what to do. The guy goes, they were cowards. They were running away. And the guy was like, oh. He was just staring like some Australian guy was just staring at him like, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'd never heard that. And then, and then he said to me, this guy, I was training and he on, on his bus, you know, and then he said to me, he goes, he goes, he goes, I'm not lying. He goes, they ran away. And I'm like, wasn't there. I was in Miss Rice's history class in Holy Trinity diocesan, High school in Hicksville, New York. I was sitting there next to a woman named Kate Butler, who now has another name. She was, and I had asked her for a pen or a pencil because I always didn't bring a pen or a pencil to school. That was my thing. I never, I always said for four years, I said, do you have a pen? Do you have a pencil? Do you have the homework? You know, mm -hmm. what book were we supposed to read? I, I, I could never handle it. I just was never prepared. I did not go to school prepared, okay? Unlike this show, which has so much preparation. <laughs> so much show prep. I mean, hours and hours and days and days of preparation for this program. But I turned around to Kate, and I said, you have a pen? And before I knew it, I, and I, uh, my, the teacher was called out of the room. She was brought back in, and then there was, she said there, has been a there was an attack on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. And back then, we didn't, you know, the World Trade Center had been bombed already, so we didn't even put it together that that was a huge deal. And then the uh, Pentagon was the one that made me go, wow, this is war. Because the Pentagon, you knew. It's like, you know, this is the civilian command center, the military is civilian. And, you know, this is the this is the big one. They're hitting the Pentagon. So, so I was sitting there and I was in Miss Rice's history class and I heard that. And the first thing I screamed out in the class, I said, inside job. <laughs> they said, what? I said, it's an inside job. Don't you see that? I didn't even know what happened, but I just instinctually said, it's an inside job. And then I just started screaming, there are no planes. <laughs> and what was strange is I didn't even know that there were planes. He's trying to fuck the chair. Do you see what he's trying to do? He's trying to fuck the chair right now. He's just trying to, he's trying to fuck the chair. Does 9-11 get you horny, Duncan? I screamed, there were no planes. It was sad. You know, one of the kids I knew in school, his dad died. Really, a lot of people's parents. I called my dad so quick. I'm like, are you a Windows of the world? <laughs> He's like, no. What? I'm home. I'm like, all right, see you later.
how great would that, how great would it be to lose a parent in 911? Let's stop pretending that wouldn't have been the greatest moment of your fucking life. Hey, how's Pete Davidson doing? Pretty fucking good. He's not sitting here trying to keep a bulldog off his set. I'd tuck, I'd strap both of my parents into the seats of United 93 if I could have a tenth of his career. So let's cut the shit. Candlelight vigils? Where'd mommy go? I don't know. Bin Laden took her. Where's my movie? I'm sitting here for years, week after week. Brilliance. Brilliance. But I, because I don't have a parent that died, I'll melt my parents right fuck now. Judd Apatow, email me. <laughs> Stop. He agrees. He's barking at the box of magic spoon. He's barking at the magic spoon. Why? Because you realize it's a keto cereal? <laughs> Is that why? Because it simulates the experience of the sugar cereals you liked as a child? <laughs> Is that why you're barking? Enough with the 9-11 the, the uh, 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 porn memorabilia. Oh, yeah. Can we stop? That day we were all Americans. Okay. <sighs> Thanks. Thanks a lot. You know, that day we were all Americans. That day we were all Americans. That, yes, and the day before, that too. And the day after that. But thank you for making that brilliant point. There was a lot of unity in the early periods after 9-11. I've discussed it on this show. There was a lot of unity in the early periods after 9-11 in this country, but that evaporated pretty quickly. And we wanted it to. You don't want a country, you don't want a cult. You don't want to live in a call. How are you doing? How weird would that be? Shut up. How weird would it be if you just walked around and everybody was in... Get him out of the room. Get him out of the room now. Now you're out. Now you're out. Because you can't handle the responsibility. Send him out, please. You leave now. We're discussing 9-11. You have a little respect. Put them in the kitchen, please. My point is that you don't want to live in a constant funeral. And all these people that are just glorifying the immediate aftermath of 9-11 as if it's the goal, as if that's the goal, to walk around with your head bowed, thinking about your own mortality every minute of every day. It's not the goal, by the way. And it was nice for a few days. A couple of vigils are nice, but you don't want to live in a vigil. So can we stop, please, romanticizing this idea? I don't like where we are now, clearly. We've gone off the rails quite a bit, culturally, in this country. But this idea that everything has to be right after 9-11, when it was so nice, it was nice for a few days. I'm just sick of all these people on Facebook being like, well... We were all Americans that day. People love talking about other heroic people. People love that. They, lo they think it makes them heroic by talking about other people that were heroic. You know? Remember the heroes. You know? I'm just saying, I would have been willing to sacrifice more than I sacrificed in 9-11 which was very little. I would have been willing to sacrifice more. And I think it's important that we all remember that. You know? So that's my little commentary on 9-11. It changed New York dramatically. And I put something up on Instagram about this. If you knew about New York City before 9-11, it changed New York dramatically. It made New York a victim. It made New York vulnerable. And then, you know, New York was this tough city that it, it was not nearly as uh, criminal as it had been, it was getting safer, but it was a tough city. And then it became, you know, uh, about um, Midwestern tourists coming to save New York City. That's when you had the Disney on Broadway start. Tourists were coddled and catered to. And it became a city that was very specific. It made it into a very general city where everybody can enjoy it. It is what it is. Eventually, it... Um, you know, all the restaurants in New York City, uh, a lot of them were French. 
and a lot of fine dining or uh, luxury uh, was very opulent in the 90s. It was very frilly. There was a lot of lace and big tablecloths and banquets. And, I mean, it looked very like you were eating in uh, Versailles. And then after 9-11, that felt inappropriate. That felt wrong. And then the green market movement started. And, you know, all these restaurants kind of made themselves look half done. There was exposed brick and steel and pipes. And it just, you're more connected to your environment than you had been. You wanted to eat on a wooden table. And things were real. And it, it really changed New York City. If you, if you knew New York City pre-9-11, many of you don't. But it really did change New York City. You could take that down. But you could, you could read that if you have any interest in it. 